In the previous video, we developed the population linear model to describe differences among people in cost of flight on the basis of which airline they were flying on. Now, let's turn to the sample model, the thing we'll actually be working with in real science that will give us a way to estimate that population model. And specifically, our main interest will be representing or estimating those population TAW sub J's. Remember, the TAW sub J's are the offsets associated with the different airlines. And our main interest, if we're doing this study or collecting these data, will be to understand whether those TAW sub J's in the population are actually there. In other words, do we think that the airline somebody is flying on is really affecting the average cost of flight for different individuals? Now let's use the same data we've seen, those 100 randomly selected individuals, and let's develop a sample model that again describes these data in terms of an overall mean and offsets for each individual group. We'll still have to deal with individual error, but we'll come back to this because it takes on a special term when we're dealing with a sample model. Our one-factor linear model in a sample will actually have the exact same components. But notice we don't have Greek symbols, instead we're using Roman characters to represent the fact that these are not true parameters of a population model. Instead, these will be our estimates of that population model. But we have the same components. We're still trying to describe the score on Y for the ith individual in the jth group. And we're describing the score as a function of the estimated grand mean the Y bar plus T sub J's, the estimated treatment effect for each group sub J, and plus E sub IJ, which is the error in our model. We'll still call this error, but more formally in a sample model, we'll call this the residual. And we call it the residual because in principle, we're not measuring the true error in the population. Instead, we're measuring the residual or what's left over in our model after we've subtracted away the grand mean from each person and the estimated treatment effect for each person. The residual is simply what's left over, the difference between an individual's score and the mean of the group that they're a member of. Now that we have our sample model, let's look at how we might estimate these different components and what meaning they will actually give us. Let's start with the T sub J's, which are again the principal reason for doing any of these studies. We're interested in what these offsets are because we hope they'll reflect the true offsets in the population. Looking at our data, we can see that the treatment offsets are really the same thing. That is, in any sample data, it's still just the difference between a group and the actual grand mean. But notice two important things about these treatment offsets. The first is that the calculation of them is fairly trivial. We simply find the mean for each of the groups and find the difference between that mean for each group and the grand mean. Second, notice that these T sub J's, the T1, T2, and T3, are not a perfect representation of the population. Just like any sample statistic, these will have sampling error. Even though they're numerically the same as when we were working with population data, know that whenever we take samples, the T sub 1, T sub 2, T sub 3 will not be exactly equal to the TAW sub 1, TAW sub 2, or TAW sub 3. Remember, whenever we take a sample and calculate a mean, the mean of that sample will not be identical to the population mean. In this case, we're taking a difference between a sample mean and the grand mean. Each of those are estimates of the population mean for each group and the population grand mean. So each of these treatment offsets is still a sample statistic and still will incur sampling error. Our goal here is to know whether these T sub J's, whether they're actually there in the population. And to do that, we're gonna be comparing like we always do, our treatment or our sample estimates against some benchmark for error. How much difference should we expect in these treatment offsets simply by chance alone? So our T sub J's, again, reflect our guess about the effect of that factor in the population. But those T sub J's will be non-zero even if there really isn't an effect in the population. In this case, even if airline doesn't really matter for the cost of a flight, we'll still get non-zero T sub J's. So our goal will be to determine whether those T sub J's are big enough that we can reject the idea that they were simply sampling air differences. And the way we're going to do this is by looking at those residuals, the E sub I J's. Now let's remember what these represent before I go on and show you any more formulas. The E sub I J's in our sample model 
It's just the difference between the score on Y for any individual, for instance, Tom, who paid something like $360, and the group mean that Tom is a member of. So the E sub IJ is simply the difference between an individual's score and the mean of the group that they're a member of. Now, formally, we can represent or describe the E sub IJs with the following formula. The E sub IJs are equal to the Y IJ, that is, the individual's actual observed value, and the Y hat IJ, which is the value predicted by the model. So these terms, the Y IJ and the Y hat IJ, is really the residual or the air. Now, the Y hat IJ is probably a new term for you. The hat simply means a predicted value. And let's remember what's predicted for any individual. Again, let's take Tom. Tom was a member of the Delta group. He flew on Delta Airlines. And so what we would predict for Tom, knowing nothing else, would be simply the mean of the Delta group. So the Y hat IJ also has a definition. The Y hat IJ, the predicted score on Y, for the ith individual in the jth group is simply the grand mean plus the treatment offset for that group. Notice that this is almost our complete model, but we don't have the individual error. Once we remove error from the model, we're simply making a prediction for an individual, and that simply is their group mean. So notice that everything on the right-hand side here is really just the sample mean for the group J, which we can represent as the Y bar J. And notice that this is a very simple definition. The predicted score for a person is just whatever the mean is of the group they're in. And if you think about this a little bit, that's the best we can really do. If we know something about the treatment offsets, how much above or below average a group will be paying, then if we had to predict for any person in a group, we would simply predict the group mean. Now before we go on, I want to show you one more convention that'll be important for us as we move forward. That is, with the Y bar J, we're actually averaging over all the individuals in the Jth group. That is, if we're talking about the group mean for delta, Y bar 1, we're really averaging over all the individuals or the I's in that group. So formally, for the notation, we actually write this group mean as the Y bar dot J. Now again, this is simply bookkeeping. It's nothing very complicated. This is simply a way of keeping track of the fact that we average over individuals. And this is really, again, just bookkeeping. It's convenient for us to put that dot there so that when we actually write out subscripts, we know we're not referencing the Y for an individual. We're simply taking the average over all the individuals in that jth group.